coming up on Chopper's election podcast. Are you impressed by the caliber of our political leaders? Would you employ any of them? For the oh, CBI? I think that they are in their perfect jobs, don't you? <laughs> Not working for CBI. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Chopper's Election Podcast. My name is Christopher Hope and I'm the Telegraph's Chief Political Correspondent. Today I'm out and about at the CBI Annual Conference, which is where the creme de la creme of British business come together to discuss, well normally, research, development, HR opportunities, how to leave my current employer and join a new one, that kind of thing. But this year it's a bit different. This is the only time the conference has ever been held during a general election campaign. And the upcoming poll on December the 12th is, as you can imagine, never far from anyone's lips. Not least because Boris Johnson, Jeremy Corbyn and Joe Swinson are three of the people taking the stage to sell their ideas to a particularly clued up audience. So on today's show, I'll be hearing from top business leaders with their reaction to what they've heard today as well as their thoughts on the state of play amid this massive political instability. The CBI, or the Confederation of British Industry, claims to speak for tens of thousands of British companies. And they're the reasons why hundreds of them and their representatives have come here to somewhere near the Millennium Dome in London for this major event on the corporate calendar. And first up, I'm thrilled to be joined by Dame Carolyn Fairburn, the CBI's Director General. Thank you for inviting me into your, your place here, oh, Carolyn, you are the very, You are very welcome, Chris. It's a delight to have it's you. It's a very grand office. I say that an office. It's a meeting room. Uh-huh. It's a meeting room. At Were you surprised by the lack of reaction to Boris Johnson reversing a £6 billion cut for your members on corporation tax in front of you, in front of them? I mean, he didn't even hide from it. He did it, didn't he? Well, I think we need to go and look at it quite quite carefully, Chris. I mean, it's... Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. If you talk to business, uh, talk to our members, mm. corporation tax is only one of many taxes they pay, and actually it isn't the biggest. Um, we are already pretty competitive globally on corporation tax, and I think one of the reasons you didn't kind of um, see uh, a huge reaction in the room is that if reversing that cut means that there can be reductions in some of the other burdens on business that are even more biting. Mm -hmm. And business rates is the biggest one, by far, a really uh, damaging uh, tax. Then I think that's a conversation to be had. Uh, So I think that's why. The Tories have cut from 28% in 2010 to 19% today, and the plan would go to go to 17% in April. But, I, but he, did, he did say he thought he might get the stage stormed and then your chairman appeared behind him when he was speaking. That, that was quite amusing. But I, it did, I did, Coincidence, I think. Coincidence, <laughs> yes, it was. But it did seem to me, I, mean, I do not think though that the rather extreme left-wing policies that Jeremy Corbyn's mm-hmm. pushing has meant that a Tory PM can get away with that sort of betrayal, I would, might argue, of the business audience. And, and they think, well, he's not Jeremy Corbyn, so I'll let him get away with it. Uh, I actually genuinely don't think about that issue, that it, uh, that it's in that category, right. um, in that um, we, as I say, there are other taxes that are that are. Well, if I go back to, to, to business rates, biggest property taxes in the G7, a real break on our competitiveness. No one has gripped them. We've been, you know, asking for you know, radical reform for yeah. years, and you know now we have uh, the possibility of real reduction in business rates. I mean, you know, yes. Boris Johnson that also enough, said though? that. Is that enough compared to the scale of what? Well, the this is what we need to work out. So, so, so um, we need to examine it. But I don't think that the business community is knee jerk about the the ongoing reduction. As I say, the trade off would have to. You genuinely help with competitiveness because we are falling behind. We know that, but you know, let's have a look at it. But it's not, it's it's not something the business is saying. Oh my God, this is this is terrible. As long as the costs are cut in other areas, is the point that you trust Boris Johnson to cut taxes because that's the trend of the Tory government? I think it's is more. Is that why you're not worried about it? I, well, I, I think I think it's more that we've only just heard it. So we're going to want to see the detail. Um, and it's, it, is, it is going to need to start. It's disappointing, though, Carolyn Fairburn. 
what, what, can't even it, say that. What is, it is going to need to stack up. It is going to have to come back in other ways. Because, you know, what is absolutely right is that we have got flat investment in this country. Actually, it's declining. Um, we know that we have a massive productivity problem. And if we carry on loading costs onto business, that will continue. And we, um, we won't get the economy back on track. Um, we're going to want to see how this stacks up. But I have to say, you know, businesses aren't dying over a ditch over this particular tax as long as the tax burden overall uh, is reduced. There's other things to worry about, like Brexit. Now, you're, you're really in a, in a bind, aren't you, at the CBI? Because you've got Jeremy Corbyn trying to literally uh, land grab a business stuff back into the state control, which you would, well, you, you are concerned about, no question. And you've got Boris Johnson delivering Brexit, which you're not happy with by the end of January. Not an easy place for the DG of the CBI. Well, it's not. I think the, the more important point, Chris, it's not an easy place if you're running a business. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. You know, if you, uh, you know, if you look at a potential new world of pain next year, which is the prospect of a, you know, even if the deal is passed in January, uh, in, in December or early January, you've got the January the 31st deadline, you've then got June, and then you've got another potential cliff edge in December. And I think what um, our members most want to hear is that we're not going to be in the same place next year that we've already been in twice this year because it is so incredibly costly. So vote Tory then? What you're saying vote is, is because... We never, the Because we never Come on, tell Karen, people it's, it's, it's how It's you and vote. me, no one's we here. You're saying tell. vote Tory, aren't you? I'm saying whoever is well, because in charge what are of Brexit. You, the a, Labour will get a deal in six months and then there's a vote on that deal. That's a year. That's a year of more of uncertainty for your members compared to clarity by January. We're all about outcomes uh, in our business. And, you know, what we said from the beginning, Chris and you and I have had many conversations, frictionless trade, um, regulatory alignment where it matters, and uh, a great deal for our services. Th that, those are the yardsticks. And we are a very long way from that still. Yeah. We really are. Um, whichever direction you, 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 you face. But I think that the immediate concern for, for, for the members, members I speak to is that no deal is still a possibility. Mm. We could still ramp up to it next year and actually um, that, uh, particularly with all the other things we need to do, is yeah. not a place anyone wants to be. Now the Telegraph published a leader at the weekend saying, can the CBI get over its Brexit sulk and get down to business? And you were asked on stage about that, weren't you? And you, you don't think the CBI is in a Brexit sulk? Not at all. We, we, as, as, I, as I said on stage, I mean, we haven't spent a minute trying to reverse the results of the referendum. You know, we were first out of the blocks after the referendum with a report called Making a Success of Brexit. Um, we've been all about how you get the right kind of deal. We have actually supported a deal every time it has come to Parliament, which is not true of everybody. And we are deal? saying we can work with this deal. So, you know, th this is just not... You know, and. and it's very interesting to me that quite a lot of the reports for that article were from the very early days of the previous. So that, uh, that was government. old CBI, not new CBI. Well, I, I think it was. I think it was just people who aren't around anymore. Um, so no sulking, uh, but we we have to. You know, we still have a real worry around no deal, and I think that that's that's going to be with but us that until can't be we taken have off the a... table in any any negotiation, or else you wouldn't get a deal in the first place. So you see why it's there, don't you? I think businesses do understand the point about the negotiating leverage. I think they do. I think what they understand a lot less is where no deal is actually ideology of its own, whether it actually becomes the preference for some people. It's not the preference for the majority of people. I think that actually the business voice has been heard pretty well there. You know, I think that mm. the, the case has been heard about the impact on jobs, uh, manufacturing, supply chains, um, you know, real communities, real people. But yeah, the risk is still there. Uh, and, I, and I think that the thing that, that we feel is that it's not a time for anyone to be boxing themselves in, um, where we could easily find ourselves back, you know, at ground zero, climbing up that, that mountain again of no deal uh, far too quickly. So um, no boxing in, I think, would be our, our hope. Jeremy Corbyn told your members he's not anti-business. Mm. Do you believe him? Well, it, it's, a, it's a curious thing, isn't it? You know, he talks about the need for investment. He talks about actually quite a lot of the things that business really wants. You know, we do want a new vocational uh, world where we have apprentices, where we have investment in innovation, infrastructure. So these are all really, really good things. Uh, and I think... You know, our, our conversations around business need on that's been great. Where I think we part company is where his solutions to those problems are about massive state intervention and massive 
ownership of businesses. Um, because actually, I don't think it will get, it, you know, it won't get, get where we want to go. Um, it will actually chill investment. What we have seen with the announcement of the part B, uh, the, the, the nationalisation of part of BT is already that has put a pause on really valuable investment that was going to get broadband faster to more people. What, what's the evidence of that? I mean, that, that's a big claim to make. Do you know things are now not happening at OpenReach that were going to happen? Well, actually, I think quite a lot of this is actually from other broadband providers who are who are watching this and thinking, you know, what about that us? Happens to them, yeah. Uh, so um, I think there are a number of examples that are in the in the public domain. Uh, so um, th- you know, this, this is this this is ideology, uh, and you know, our pro- you know our proposition back to Labour is we need a mix here. We need a mix of public and private. Uh, and um, we we would like Labour to recognise far more clearly the value that prisons brings. Uh, we recognise the value that uh, the, the government brings. You you get them both working together. Um, so no, I think this is a real area of difference with Labour, and one that we you know, we really worry will chill uh, our economy. Do you think Britain can cope with those the twin uncertainty of what well, Brexit is exists and the possibility? Of, of what Jeremy Corbyn wants to do to this country, which is reverse 30 years of going the other way in terms of privatising assets and business. Well, you say cope. I mean, a business is incredibly resilient. So, you know, we've seen it over the last uh, few years of, of real uncertainty, but it's just not what we want to do, Chris. I mean, if you look at the the things that we're trying to, to achieve, we are trying to you know, really succeed in the in this fourth industrial revolution. That means reskilling nine in ten people. I talked about it this morning. You know, you can't do that if you haven't got strong businesses investing and growing. So, yeah, could we cope? Of course, we could cope. But we it's would be a we would be will be a, a, a less prosperous economy as a result. What do they? What do your members fear more, Brexit or a Corbyn government? You know what? They hate that comparison. You've asked me that one before, I know, Chris. Like, I know. Well, just think, it, it's just a choice that no business wants to be it's making. It's a Hobson's choice. It's, it's a Hobbs. It, it is just a bad choice. And it's a bad cho- choice for the people of this country as well. Uh, so we want a, you know, a, a, a decent Brexit deal. We do think we should leave. Um, we do think that there is an opportunity to create the right kind of trade deal. Um, but we also want a proper a competitiveness-led, pro-enterprise economic policy framework. Put Put those two together, and the world is our oyster. And it's finally, Karen Fairburn. I was watching them, watching the, the two candidates for prime minister come one after the other. Very rarely at the CBI conference, would you hire any of those two candidates for the oh, CBI? I think that they are in their perfect jobs, don't you? <laughs> Not working for the CBI, then. <laughs> <laughs> Karen Fairburn, thank you. Oh, thank you, Chris. Always great to be here. Right. Don't go anywhere. In just a moment, I'll be joined by Ian Wright, the Chief Executive of the Food and Drink Federation, right after this. Hello, I'm Mick Brown, and I write for The Telegraph magazine. That means I spend my days with my head deep in books and trawling Google and writing profiles, interviews, and investigative stories. This year, I've been writing about psychedelic drugs, as a possible cure for the world's greatest public health crisis, depression. And in a world exclusive with my colleague Robert Mendick, I tracked down and exposed India's most wanted man, the diamond dealer Nirav Modi, who was accused of embezzling $2 billion from one of India's biggest banks. But stories like these take time, and as we all know, time means money. That's where our subscribers come in. Without them, we just can't write the stories you enjoy reading or make podcasts like this one. So if you'd like to support what we're doing and to get unlimited access to the huge range of quality journalism on politics, business, lifestyle and more, go to telegraph.co.uk slash chopper where we have a special listener offer. You can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph online and then after that it's just £2 a week. That's telegraph.co.uk slash chopper, or click on the link in the show notes to this episode. Ian Wright, Chief Executive of the Food and Drink Federation, and welcome to the Chopper's Election podcast, live from the CBI conference here in the Docklands. How very exciting, yes. Didn't you think it wasn't much of a ripple of, of a murmur of discontent about this abandoning of the £6 billion 
tax cut for companies in April. What happened there? Well, I, I was very surprised when he said, the Prime Minister said, I thought the stage was going to be stormed. I thought people might have woken up, but that mm-hmm. was about as much. I don't think there's been a huge call from business for lower corporation tax for some two or three years. Mm. And I think if they can, businesses can see where the money is going to go, and they're going to see that it's going to in some way prime the economy, they'll be absolutely fine about it. So they understand that there's always these kind of trade-offs, and it was announced in 2016 by George Osborne before Brexit. Yes. On to Brexit. Yes. How is the Food and Drink Federation coping with the concern about BLTs running out? (laughs) Well, there are some concerns about lots of things running out, but not right now. So the big concerns we have are with a no-deal Brexit, whether it comes at the end of... January next year or whether it comes at the end of next year altogether. Mm. That's a big concern. Uh, But the other concerns about the practicalities are, let us suppose that we do leave the EU at some point in January, the withdrawal bill gets through and we're in a transition. Then the concerns come about the deal that will be done with the EU on trade and there's a real worry about an issue of regulatory convergence or divergence For the food and drink industry, the regulatory issue is very important. It's not a competitive issue, it's a standards issue, and it's an access to Europe issue. So if we make uh, products here that are going into the EU, if we have different standards, the chances are we're going to have to produce two sets of what are called stock keeping units, two sets of products, and that uh, one for here, one for the EU, and that makes it much more expensive. When you say standards, that's, in, that's hygiene standards, basically, but surely they can't be differ a great deal because they guarantee no one gets ill when they well, consume your products. And that is a big concern. Now, one of the things that, that is at the heart of people's constant confidence, resilient confidence in the UK food industry, against scares like the very unfortunate young woman who got... Uh, who died because of eating something where she was allergic to nuts, or the issue in Manchester where people died after eating contaminated sandwiches in hospital. Surprisingly, the British shopper bounces back pretty quickly. That's because they believe that the vast majority of food and drink is really high quality. If that was to be undermined, and one of the issues is this question of whether if you put different standards, you said that this was a particularly lower standard, you put it on the packaging, you made it very clear, Uh, consumers could opt for it. I think that's a dangerous road to go down because it gives the impression that there isn't a unitary standard for the whole of British food. Well, labelling, I I think, was the answer of Michael Gove when he was Environment Secretary to the concern about chlorinated chicken. Just label up as the US imported so you can decide if you want to pay cheaper from the States or better quality in the UK. But you don't think labelling is the answer of dealing with those those concerns? No, because I think I I, I have a lot of admiration for Michael, who I think is by far the best uh, agriculture, food, environment secretary for years. And he's, in my view, the most able minister in the government. And I have, as I say, I have a lot of admiration for him. I've worked quite closely with him. I have a huge regard for him. I just don't agree with him on this one issue because I think if you undermine people's total confidence, then they've got to start picking and choosing and then they they, they begin to worry... And I think that becomes very difficult for consumers. They like the... And shoppers. They like the idea of unitary standards. Your members are who, just to remind us again, are they... Our members are food manufacturers, importers and producers. So we go from single people, work, single traders working on their kitchen table all the way up to the Coca-Colas, Nestle's and Associated yeah. British Foods. So the biggest impact on them from the election and maybe Brexit, because the two things are intertwined, is on immigration. Is that a concern? Yeah. And how that's resolved the, the, the supply of labour to those factories? Yes, we have 450,000 workers in food and drink manufacturing and a third of them are Europeans. Um, And we have seen constant impacts. Whenever there's a a statement made that in some way undermines their confidence about staying in the UK, even if that's not intended, uh, we see a pulse of people go home. Because these, a lot of these people are here permanently and are settled here and will always be here. But a lot of people are here for a period and they're here primarily to send home remittances, income, to their home uh, families at home. And if they can do that from somewhere else, they will. And, of course, the exchange rate here, as against some other European country, is the other big determinant. So if the pound is doing badly and the euro is doing relatively well, then the chances of them going are much higher. And, of course, the concern is if the new immigration rules are income-related, then people you're describing would be on lower levels, wouldn't they? And they may be, they may be cut out altogether from supplying the, the factors you're talking about. Yes, and I think, I think this is complicated because... 
the income can be different in the relative income can be different in different places. So where I live in the East Midlands, uh, thirty thousand is quite a good salary. In London, it can be much much less uh, less important as a or less significant as a salary. So that's an issue. And then the other issue is if you move to a points based system, somebody's got to decide which jobs get points. And we heard today here about uh, very briefly about the skill needed to work in abattoirs. Now that. Would an abattoir job get the right number of points? I don't know. Uh, and then if you look across the whole chain, there's the whole question of what happens in hospitality. So it's a complicated issue. I'm going to ask you about the, the election. What, yeah. what makes you lose sleep more, Jeremy Corbyn as PM or Brexit in January? Um, well, I don't sleep at all as a consequence. <laughs> um, I, I do think, I think, I think the thing that people have missed about the Corbyn uh, possibility is that... A Corbyn government, I think, by common consent, is only going to happen if uh, if it's propped up in some way by the SNP and possibly with a supply agreement with the other parties. Well, that means Indy Ref 2 comes before Brexit Ref 2 because there's no other way that works for Mrs Sturgeon, Chief Minister Sturgeon. So the consequence of that is that the Brexit matter will not be resolved for nine or 12 months. So the idea that it's going to be done in six make, just is not credible. You to want me. to get the, the deal done within six Yes. And then have a, a vote after that, I think, is what I understood this, but, but this morning. But that means that it has to be after Indie Ref, too, because uh, the SNP has to have that before the Brexit referendum, otherwise they lose one of their key cards. So I think that's quite a difficult thing to understand, and I think that does have a big impact for business. I'm sure business will have a view on both of those referendums. And you're obviously, in the, you can't make a choice, can you? No, not, at this stage, not at this stage. And I mean, I think, you know, we what we need is an election that isn't being isn't being conducted on the basis of a race to the bottom in terms of promises of spending. I mean, that's the bit business looks on aghast, actually. Mm. It's just bonkers, some of this, because it's fantasy economics. And we know that half of these pledges are never going to get tested. So why are they bothering? Jeremy Corbyn said 330,000 apprentices in England in year one. Is that even achievable? I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, and I think that's true. That was in the the green economy. I mean, that's a huge number of people. I know. Well, we haven't got that many now. (laughs) So, I mean, I do think the, these, these whole, all of the fact-checking that is going on, and I know mm. Telegraph is doing that as well, I mean, I think that's really important. Mm. Well, Ian, Ian Wright, thank you so much for coming in to talk to Chopper's Elections Podcast at the CBI conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, what do CBI members make of what they've heard today? Well, first up, we've got Gordon Wilson, the CEO of Advance, the UK's third largest software company. Now, Gordon, just briefly, what is uh, Advanced, please? So Advanced is the third largest UK headquartered software business. We employ about 1,800 people in the UK and about 700 outside the UK. Uh, And we focus on kind of three main markets, health and care, the legal sector, and public and private FMS, payroll and HR systems. What's your biggest concern, Gordon, at the moment? Is it Boris Johnson's intent on delivering Brexit by the end of January, or is it Jeremy Corbyn's encroachment of the, of the state on areas of business? I think I've got a number of concerns, uh, to, <laughs> to be honest. We can uh, list them for you. Yeah, yeah, in fact, how long have you got? But uh, <laughs> I think my fundamental biggest concern is just where business and the country is at the moment that there's just no clear direction, there's no debates and dialogue happening about the really important things, about how do we get productivity, how do we grow the economy, how do we get better schools, you know, just all these things are just not being discussed. So that's my biggest concern. That's a macro level, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, On so, the micro level yeah. for your business. So then I come down and I think, so which leader uh, do I want to actually you know, so go with? I was just talking to a chap from ITN, uh, and uh, he was saying, so what did I think about the two presentations this morning? And I thought, well, that's a tough one because, <laughs> because there wasn't really a standout. Uh, you, know, you know, so there was Boris, uh, his usual humour, his personality came across, but a little bit unstructured. And, you know, what were the clear messages there? Because there were, you know, there were so many all rammed up. Uh, and then you had Mr. Corbyn, a bit wooden in the presentation, quite a lot of structure to it but I think that's so he probably didn't get blown off course and I, you know so I was asked to kind of mark them out a 10 and I gave Mr Corbyn a 5 and I gave kind of Boris a 6.5 which is a bit of an indictment that our next future leader yeah. can't even get over 6.5 out of 10 so at a micro level yeah 
that concerns me. Uh, and then we haven't mentioned Brexit yet, Gordon. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. And then what Mr. Corbyn wants to do with turning it into a state, uh, and what Boris wants to do about driving us out of Europe without a deal. Now, I'm not actually sure he will do that. By the way, I think that's rhetoric around his negotiating position. And I'd like to think that we had a negotiated deal when we actually left Europe. So Which I think he wants too. And the yeah. only way no deal can happen now is, I think, by the end of 2020, 2020 assuming we get the deal Correct. through. Correct, yeah. Everyone's assuming that it happens. If not, yeah. goodness knows. Well, it seems like, do you think that Boris Johnson there, he, he said to you suddenly that he's not going to cut corporation tax from 19% to 17% in April, saving mm. $6 billion. And no one batted an eyelid. Either you weren't listening or you were looking at your phones for too long. What, what happened there? No, I, I actually think that's probably the right decision, to be honest. Uh, you know, it was not that long ago, it was 29%. So I think business has had a fair, a fair deal uh, over the years in corporation tax. And there are things that really need to be invested in in the economy to make it a fairer economy, to make it a fairer country, more provision in schools, more provision in the NHS. The things that really need some serious investment spent. So I think it's probably a good yeah, call. The Tories have cut it from 28% in 2010 to 19% yeah, today, yeah. and the plan was, and that was also was a George Osborne tax yeah, cut yeah, yeah. in 2016, so they may have felt it wasn't mine, although yeah. it wasn't on the Tory watch. Are you impressed by the calibre of our political leaders? Would you employ any of them? Uh, actually, I would employ a couple of them. Uh, the Which ones? Well, there's a bit of an irony here, but I do like Chuka Amuna. I, I, Lib, Lib Dem listeners. Yeah, well, yeah, but I'm, <laughs> I shouldn't say how I'm going to vote, but it's not for the Lib Dems. I can, uh, but yeah, I think he's a high caliber individual. I think he's, he engages his brain first and then he talks. So I would employ him. Would you employ Boris Johnson or Jeremy Corbyn? I'll pass on that if that's okay. <laughs> that's, that's quite an indictment now, given these people are leading this country yeah. through the Brexit talks and... Mm. Well, the thing is, I have a rule. If I was in charge of appointing politicians, anyone who wanted to be a politician wouldn't get through for the fact they wanted to be a politician. <laughs> I think we should have politicians who don't want to be politicians, who actually understand what the big bad world's about and actually can bring something to the party. Rather than being special advisors and arrest for so long, they would be have a different career and then start it when they're 40 or something. Correct. Understand and experience life. Understand and experience the knocks and the challenges that people have in their daily lives. I think some of them are just a little bit in a vacuum to that. Now, I'm not saying they all are, but I think quite a few of them are. What do you fear more as a sort of getting Brexit or Jeremy Corbyn government in your business? Gee whiz. Uh, <laughs> I fear a Jeremy Corbyn government more than Brexit. Now, why is that? Because, in my opinion, Although some of their ideas are interesting, I think the means to the end is just going to be a disaster. It's quite a risk, isn't it? I mean, it's, it really is a grab by the state of oh. vast areas of this country's corporate infrastructure. Look at, look at bits of BT, look at water companies, rail companies, energy companies. And do you think the country is ready for another massive gamble, given we're going through Brexit at the same time? I, I absolutely don't think it is. Uh, but I stress, I think some of their ideas are actually worth debating, things like broadband. But how to get there? Absolutely not by a state land grab. And trains. I think trains are the ones a lot of people agree on when it's not working. And Well, you know, it's pockets of trains. I use the trains a lot. And 95% of all of the rail network I'm on, it's great. And it's a lot better than it was 20 years ago. But there are pockets like southern trains, they had a bit of a disaster, northern trains. But fix those two rail franchises. And I think it's not in a bad place. Gordon Wilson, you'd be fantastic. And thank you for coming on Chopper's Election Podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, next up, John Neal is here. He's head of UK research at JLL, which advises companies on where to locate in Britain, from overseas or within this country. So are you seeing this, um, as Boris Johnson called, a tidal wave of investment waiting to come to this country, if only we can leave the European Union in January? Or was that, to quote the Dems, bollocks? <laughs> 
Well, um, I, there was certainly a huge amount of money looking to get into real estate around the world. And the UK, from a, from a property point of view, the UK has a number of huge advantages. In London, Even despite the three years of not delivering the result of 2016. I'll come on to that in a second. I mean, <laughs> th- th- there are downsides to this as well, I think. But, you know, th- there is a lot of money looking at real estate. The UK still has a lot of fundamental advantages. You know, we have, we have big lot sizes in London. You know, there's big, chunky investments for overseas investors. It's a very transparent market. We have a pretty good uh, legal system, you know, we have the whole history of um, you know, property rights and so on, and of course, familiarity, the English language. I wouldn't say there hasn't been a Brexit impact, though. Um, certainly, after the referendum, we saw a definite slowdown. But I think after about six months, the market got used to the idea that nothing was going to change dramatically. And yes. I think people expected a soft Brexit, let's be honest. Um, more recently, the market slowed again, definitely, I think, in the last couple of quarters. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of investment now into continental Europe in preference, I think, to London. So Germany's done quite well, and particularly this year, Paris as well. Is that because they can't see an end to this uncertainty? Do you think? I, I, think, I think it's just it's a temporary blip, though, I think. I think if we get a deal, I think we'll see... You know, if you're looking at property around London, there are plenty of people looking at the moment. Um, why would you transact at this precise moment? Would you not wait just to be sure about the election, just to be sure about what's happening with Brexit, and then make the decision? So I think we will see an increase in activity next year. But of course, everyone already is talking about December and the fact that you still have to agree the final, uh, the final state, the, the future, final future trading yeah. arrangement. So I, I don't think it'll go back entirely to normal. You know, volumes have been a bit lower this year. There's no way of getting around that. That's so, sales of property. Sorry, yes, activity. I'm talking about commercial property here. Right. Sales of commercial property have been a bit lower. Um, and I think they'll improve a bit next year, but we'll have to wait until we get a full resolution, I think, before we start to see things improve. But... Um, I mean, the other advantage London has is that the returns um, on investment are higher than they are in Europe, partly because bond yields and the cost of money is so low in, low in, in, in the EU. It's mm. even lower in the EU, of course. But it's also, I think, that um, you know, London, because of Brexit, yields have, what we call yields, which is the return on the property, have remained a bit higher than in many other cities. So when people see that optimism come back, that, that stability come back, London and the, U- the wider UK will look very attractive indeed. So that's Brexit. And the other big risk that the CBI are talking about is the risk of a Corbyn administration. Yes. Eh? He was saying in his address to the, to the members today, don't panic, we can work together. Yeah. Here's my plans for appendices. And I can see you looking confused by all this stuff, John. <laughs> what do you think? Is that, is that a risk to the country in the same way that Brexit is? Well, I'd agree with, uh, with John Curtis saying that the chance of a Labour administration, I think, is pretty close to zero. It's not answering the question, though, is it? <laughs> well, um, is it a concern? I think the more radical aspects of Jeremy Corbyn's cer- programme certainly, I think, uh, uh, keep people awake at night in, in the industry. Um, I think there are, you know, there are aspects around housing and so on where I think, you know, in terms of more council housing, more affordable housing that people would have more sympathy with. But yes, I think it's, it's certainly looming as big as a hard Brexit in terms of people's concerns, uh, aspects of the programme. I think it's unlikely to happen, though, personally, looking at the polls at the moment. I think... We've been there in 2017, John. I've, lo- I've lost, you know, yes. lost all sorts of reputational issues that I had in 2017 with the I mean, failure to win by Theresa May. I think a Corbyn-led administration is more possible. But the question is what, what, what parts of the programme would survive contact with the Lib Dems, what parts of the programme would survive contact with the SNP. As it happens, I don't think some of those issues are the right way to go, some of the program, some of the policies are the right way to go about stimulating. Which is, it's whether I think Britain can handle what the Corbyn offering is, which is a huge transfer of, of assets back into state control. Yeah. It's a major rethink, really, a reversing of 30, 40 years of policy in government yeah. at the same time as we're trying to leave the European well, Union. That's why I don't, I don't know if that's been grasped by the, the Corbyn side, but I think yes. it's in, it does seem slightly alarming if you're in business. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, if you I, put I, those I, things together, I mean, you know. I think I've, I've tended to some, dismiss some of those aspects of Corbyn's programme as being uh, not that much to worry about. So I think the chance, of, as I said, of a Labour majority government is pretty small. But yes, I mean, I think that's certainly true, but I think you could probably make the argument about what all politicians are proposing at the moment you know, ultimately, we're going to have, you know, Boris Johnson's vision, which is you know, obviously more agreeable to most people in, in my industry, of a, of, of, of a Brexit Britain, which is sort of a world-beating power in everything, suddenly transforming through a one-nation conservative policy into, um, 
you know, this uh, technical powerhouse, I think is, 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 that's possible if you take a long-term view, and hopefully that's what he's aiming for. But the idea that can happen simultaneous with Brexit, I think, is, 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 is equally probably a little bit um, optimistic. But certainly, yes, I think you're right. The idea that we can transform ourselves into a socialist uh, wonderland uh, at the same time as Brexit is, is probably a bit ludic- a little bit ludicrous. Well, the result of, the, of Corbyn's position, I think, on politics is that Boris Johnson can announce the CBI that he's not going to push through a £6 billion cut for businesses in April and no one bats an eyelid or says anything. He's, this happens. Because well, they're more worried about the Corbyn offer than yes. what Boris is, um, is doing. Yes, I think so. I mean, well, ultimately, I, I do wonder whether politics has just descended into um, people who can, just, who can promote promise to the largest figure for whoever's in the room because um, uh, I mean one thing that's certainly changed I think is that across the whole spectrum is that people are far to be far less concerned about fiscal responsibility and perhaps that's the the, the bigger risk to the, the long-term economy is whether you know the UK has always been seen as being a sensible and stable country and if, if government turns the fiscal taps on then uh, you know what, what does that mean for um, for, for guilt, what does that mean for rates and so on? I don't know how, how old you are, John, I won't ask, but is it, do you, have you ever known more a turbulent and more uncertain political outlook than at the moment? Um, well, well, I mean, I, I remember the dying... I sort of came of age, I suppose, in the dying days of the major administration, so I remember, um, I remember that time quite well, and I think there's a lot of similarities, although uh, and I, I just about remember but, uh, interest rates going up into double figures. So that seemed a lot more turbulent, I think, in terms of people's lives... Um, and because get in their pockets, their mortgage is going up by yeah, exactly. by a lot of money overnight. Exactly. So, but but I think the um, I think in terms of the uh, the rhetoric, at least, it, it feels quite comparable. But having said that, I mean the amazing thing, going back to property again, is that if we look at the amount of space that's been taken in the city over the past year or so by big companies, it's going to be one of the highest on record. So if you you get rid of the political rhetoric and you go in, the down into the, are, into the actual, um, yeah. you know, the engine room of the economy, actually things look okay. I mean, who'd have thought that two years on from you know, the referendum, three years on from the referendum, three and a half years on from the referendum <laughs> even, thanks for that, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, you know, we, uh, all those forecasts of doom and gloom, that we would have one of the highest records on total for space being taken in the city of London, which is supposed to be the place that was going to be most hit by Brexit. And we certainly haven't seen you know, banks moving on mass to Frankfurt or Well, because or we Paris. haven't yet had to deliver any of the regulatory changes that need to be done on that. Well, it's, yes, it's, I think it's, it's a point. Untouched. I think you know, we, we'd always said there will be some jobs lost to the continent, but the idea there was going to be you know, tens of thousands of them was probably the ridiculous end. Well, John Neal, on the optimistic note there, Head of UK Research at JLL, thank you for coming on Chopper's Election Podcast. Thank you very much. Well, that's all for today. Huge thanks to my guests, Caroline Fairbairn, Ian Wright, Gordon Wilson, and of course, John Neal. And thank you to my producer, Theo Leludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for taking the time to listen. Since we're recording twice a week at the moment, we'll be back on Wednesday. So make sure you subscribe to this feed to be the first to hear that great episode. And if you want to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter at Brexit Broadcast or email us choppersbrexitpodcast at telegraph.co.uk. And don't forget, you can get your first 30 days subscription to all the Telegraph's brilliant journalism on politics, business, lifestyle, culture and more totally free of charge at telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. And we'll stick that link in the show notes to this week's episode. And always, always buy your copy of the Daily Telegraph. From the CBI conference, until next time, cheerio! Hello there, Telegraph podcast listener. My name is Tom Gibbs and I'm the host of our Audio Football Club podcast. If your desire for top football chat isn't sated, then may I please recommend the Telegraph's very own podcast about that subject. Audio Football Club comes out every single Monday and it features some of the best and brightest football minds in the country, taking in all the biggest stories from the Premier League and around Europe. Search for Audio Football Club wherever you get your podcasts or follow the link in the description of this episode. Good things will happen to you if you do so. 